Keep it going for Christy. That was beautiful. They love you, Christy. Keep your applause going for the Honorable Ashley Hinson, Iowa State Representative. Good evening, everybody. Hey, how many of you are from right here in Lynn County? Cheer. Yeah. Awesome. How many of you drove in from outside of Lynn County to see our president here today? Awesome. Well, what an amazing experience to be here. I am honored to be here tonight with you as we celebrate this historic event. We are just 152 days into Donald Trump's presidency and he's already coming back to Iowa. Isn't that awesome? Yes. My name is Ashley Henson. I'm what you would call a recovering journalist. I was a news anchor for more than 10 years uh, before I decided to get into uh, state politics here in Iowa. Um, I'm also an almost 34-year-old Republican mother of two, and before tonight you would have thought I might have been a unicorn, but I can see by this crowd here tonight, I am not alone. Welcome. Thank you. You know, we have some pretty amazing leadership here in Iowa from women, particularly from women. Our governor, Kim Reynolds. Our United States Senator, Joni Ernst. Our State Auditor, Mary Moseman. And our Speaker of the House, Linda Upmeyer. And I am working hard for you every day right here in Lynn County as a state representative. Every day, my focus is on doing what is best for the people of Iowa. I want Iowans to get the best deal. I want the United States to get the best deal. I want Americans to get the best deal. Who in this room is with me on that? Everyone. Absolutely. So I just finished my first legislative session, and uh, as you can imagine, what a year it was. Uh, normally as a freshman legislator, I might have been trying to figure out which stairway to use in the state capitol under the Golden Dome, or maybe where the bathrooms were. Um, but in, in this case, this year, I was off and running, floor managing some challenging bills and working for all Iowans to make our state a great place to live, work, and play. I was and continue to be focused on making sure that we all get that better deal. So I thought I'd run through a quick list of some of the ways that we in the state legislature worked for you here in Iowa to ensure you are getting a better deal. If you care about your kids getting a world-class education, how many of you care about our kids here in Iowa? I think everybody can agree that's a priority. Well, you can rest assured, schools in Iowa are getting a better deal. We, in a very tough year for our budget, protected K-12 education. We continue to invest in K-12 education, providing an additional $40 million for schools. Our budget, we afford $3.2 billion for education for K-12 schools in Iowa. That's worth clapping for, I think. We provided schools with more flexibility so they can meet specific needs, and we gave them home rule authority to encourage innovation. If you're a taxpayer, you're getting a better deal. We rebalanced Iowa's outdated collective bargaining law to provide local governments more flexibility. We removed the sunset on property assessment appeal boards so Iowans can ensure they are not being overtaxed. We combined school board and municipal elections to save taxpayers money and state employees and legislators will be paying more toward their health insurance premiums. You're getting a better deal. If you're a young married couple or you have kids, you're getting a better deal. We created the first time homebuyer savings accounts so young Iowans can put down their roots right here and purchase their first home in Iowa. We expanded Iowa's medical cannabis law to ease the suffering of sick Iowans. We worked to keep synthetic drugs out of kids' hands and off the streets. And we extended insurance coverage for autism treatments to Iowa families. And variation on a theme, if you own a business, guess what? You are also getting a better deal. 
We reset Iowa's workers' compensation law back to its original intent. We passed tort reform to reduce frivolous lawsuits. We paved the way for the next generation of high-speed internet access and 5G coverage. And we invested in community colleges to ensure Iowa workers have the skills and job training needed for 21st century careers here in Iowa. And we are not done yet. We have another legislative session coming up in about six months. We began laying the groundwork for comprehensive tax reform that will make our tax code simpler, fairer, and more competitive. A priority, I think, for everybody in this room, right? Tax reform, we need it. So we are going to make sure that Iowans get a better deal. That's my focus every day, and it is not easy to do. Um, I wasn't elected to do an easy job. I was elected to go make those tough decisions, as are all of my colleagues here, but sometimes they're downright hard. But you put your trust in me, and it is an honor to serve as a state legislator every day. Thank you so much. God bless you. applause going for the Honorable Pat Grassley, State Representative. Thank you, Pat. So you may have noticed, the, I, I'm not the Senator, but I'll do the best that I can for all of you. Unlike the Senator, I won't speak for two hours and put you all to sleep. So you can, I, I kid, I kid, I can kid him that way. Uh, but it's great to be here in Cedar Rapids, and I see there's a lot of young people. I brought my daughters with me here today because I love for them to experience things like this, and I see a lot of you did the same. And I have a daughter, my youngest daughter, named Reagan Grassley. She may run for office someday, by the way. Uh, and so I, I try to tell this story, and since there's not very many people here today and not many cameras, I'll still share this one. I usually only save this for the small events. But she was at the New Hartford Baptist Church Bible School here a few years ago, and they were talking about lying and how lying is a sin. Has anyone ever lied to you? I guess my daughter was the first one to have her hand up in the air. They, they call on her, and she goes, you mean like Obama? So... <clears throat> So, so I, will, I will tell you, I'm not the only Grassley who loves that story. So uh, first, I want to just thank each and every one of you in here. I know many of you from all across the state were reaching out to legislators throughout session. Representative Hinson covered a lot of the issues that we went over, but it's because of people like you and the encouragement that we continue to have to push forward a bold agenda, not only to get us uh, elected to office, but also this session when we had a tough session. You guys were there making those phone calls and emails and showing up to town meetings and having your voice heard. So thank you very much. We greatly appreciate that. Oh, and one more thing. I sure hope you guys enjoy getting the light fireworks off here in a couple weeks that the legislature made that happen. <laughs> Now, now I am, I'm only the uh, grandson of a farmer from Iowa, so I'm really not that important if you really think about it. But he just happens to be chair of the Judiciary Committee, and I think that there's something kind of important about that when it comes to President Trump and what we have here in Iowa with my grandfather, Senator Grassley. There was a campaign promise that President Trump made each and every one of us, and I think it was one of the issues and the reasons why we were so fired up to support him. That's the Supreme Court of the United States. We, we, we were very, very fortunate to have a list given to each and every one of us before the election. Think about that. You have a, someone running for office who's actually going to follow through with what they said they were going to do. I wonder why there's so many people here today to support Donald Trump. So, so when, when it comes to uh, President Trump, I think one of the things that we can all admire about him is the fact that he does not travel across the world and apologize for America's greatness. I, I assume based on that reaction, I'm not the only one that loves seeing the President of the United States travel all over the world and promote how great this country is and that we still are a world leader and not tear us down in front of other countries. USA! 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 Now, 
Now, as a farmer, and I know there's, there's not as many farmers in Iowa as there once was, but we are all somehow still connected to agriculture in the state of Iowa. And I will tell you, I had the opportunity to be at a meeting with the new uh, United States Department of Agriculture uh, head of that department. And the president has appointed someone in Sunny Purdue who has done a great job. And I think that is a theme that we've seen throughout the president's administration is surrounding himself with good people who know what they're doing, who are not afraid to root out the bureaucrats, which I think we're all ready for, to see that happen in Washington. So uh, Iowa farmers, I can tell you this. Uh, Iowa farmers, I can tell you this, I've had the opportunity to meet with some of these individuals uh, that are under this new administration, and they're here to root out that bureaucracy. No longer will the federal government come in and tell us that a creek running through our farm should be treated the same as the Mississippi River, or that, that dust... Or, or that dust coming out of the back of your combine somehow needs to stay within the borders. As my grandfather once said, only God controls when the wind's going to blow. But that's hard, that's hard to tell someone in Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C., the island surrounded by reality. Remember that. So with that, I appreciate you guys giving me the opportunity to come here today. I'm glad we have such a great turnout for such a great president. And I've seen several signs pop up throughout this, so I can't miss this opportunity. But I'll leave you with three words. Drain the swamp. Thank you. I saw that placard. I love it too. Drain the swamp. Wow. Well, hey, everybody. Are you excited to be here tonight? Yeah. Me too. There is not an Iowan that's more excited that President Trump is in Iowa tonight, and there is not an Iowan who's more excited that he is the President of the United States than me. I've known this man for 12 years, and I have to tell you, he changed my life for the better. 12 years ago, when he wasn't running for the president, presidency, he was Donald Trump, the American icon, and I went on his show, and he took a chance on me, a mother, an entrepreneur, an Iowan, and from that day forward, life, my life has never been the same. It's been better. And I want to thank every single one of you in this room this evening that voted for President Trump because I promise you he's going to change your life and your kid's life and your grandkid's life for the better as well. Oh, thank you. You can stand up for that one. That's right. That's right. <laughs> That's right. That is 100% right. Hey, USA is right too. Hey, we got all night. <laughs> thank you. It only takes one to start an ovation. So thank you. You guys go ahead and you can sit down. It's going to be a long night, especially if President Trump gets going here. Um, I have to say though, folks, I want to thank every single one of you who not only went out to vote for this man that I love and I've respected and I've known for over a decade, but for those of you who volunteered for us, you have no idea what that means to us. Every single one of you who volunteered, like my dear friend Jeff and my dear friend Christy and Tamara, and and all of you, there were so many of you who knocked on doors, who made phone calls, who did anything that we asked. And we are so grateful because it was, it was hard work in Iowans like yourselves who put Donald Trump into the White House. And I am so thrilled about that. So thank you. If you volunteered for the campaign, raise your hand. I want to see you. Look at all these amazing patriots. You guys are awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Wow, look at them behind us up there. Up there. You guys are absolutely amazing. And he thanks you. I was just with him at the, in the Oval Office uh, about a month ago. And he said, Tana, I want to come back to Iowa. And I said, awesome. We'd love to have you. That's awesome. Why? And he says, I just want to connect with the people. And I want to see the Iowan people. And I want to thank them. And I said, well, you already did the thank you tour. And he says, that's exactly right. I love Iowa. And he knows that without Iowa, he's not the president of the United States. And he'll never forget us. Trust me, he'll never forget you. Ever. Ever. So... Get ready to help us out. We are already
already got our vision on his reelection. We need this guy in the White House for another four years. We need him for eight years. It'll take about that long to clean up house. And let me tell you what, I just saw him and he is not hurting, he is not worried, he is not losing enthusiasm, he's not losing his stride, he's not losing sleep, he's getting the job done. So he's the toughest man I know. And I know a lot of men. He's the toughest man that I know, and I tell him that every time I see him. So I just want you all to know, don't think for one second he's, he's worried about anything. Only thing he's worried about is you, your family, your grandkids, and America. So thank you for being here. God bless you all. And I cannot say how happy I am that you all showed up. You guys are such amazing patriots, and I'm so honored to know most of you in this room. You guys have done so much, and, and he's here to thank you as well. But before that, I'd like you all to put your hands together and, and welcome my friend, the Republican Party of Iowa Chairman, Jeff Kaufman. I unloosened my jacket because I got a few things to say tonight. First of all, if you listen to the never Trump poor souls, the media with their Democratic Party talking points, the sad, the sad for Lauren, Nancy Pelosi, and Chuck Schumer, you would think that we're in the doldrums right now. But think about what we have to celebrate right now. The Georgia Congressional the Democrats threw $30 million. $30 million, and we prevailed. Now, of course, now what you're hearing on the news is, well, that isn't a real, real indication. But just before, when they thought the polling was, was right, does that sound familiar? All of a sudden, that was going to be a watershed. $30 million they put into the out-of-district candidate and the Republican Party and the Republican candidate for Trump prevailed. We've got a United States Senate that's moving now. It's imminent to pass a repeal and replace Obamacare plan. And let me tell you something. This is what Iowa has to brag about. We gave Donald J. Trump a 9% victory. We stood behind him. Iowa led the way. And let me just assure you something as a spokesperson for the Iowa Republican Party. The Iowa Libertarians are behind him. The Iowa Christian Evangelicals are behind him. The Iowa establishment is behind him. If you are Republican in this state, we stand with our president, period. We got a Democratic Party that's in disarray. They move so far left, they're almost ready to connect up to the right. They've lost every single special election. We got never Trumpers out there. You know what? I'm getting just a little tired of that too. We had Senator Ben Sass from Nebraska. He crosses the Missouri River and in that sanctimonious tone talks about what he doesn't like about Donald Trump, what he doesn't like about Donald Trump. You know what, Senator Sass? I really don't care what you like. We love Donald Trump. And if you don't love him, I'd suggest you stay on your side of the Missouri River. And the media. Anybody catch the open letter to Donald Trump on the front page of the Cedar Rapids Gazette? Come on, folks, that's Bush League. So here's the Republican Party's open letter to the Cedar Rapids Gazette editorial board. Donald Trump won this state. The citizens of Iowa gave him that victory. If you don't like it, tough.
tell you one thing, if I could go out there and give every one of you a hug, I'd do it. And by the way, Cedar Rapids Gazette, if you want to be objective, I'd suggest you put that little standing ovation in your paper tomorrow. And I see the CNN camera back there. I finally found out what CNN was about. I finally found out what CNN stands for, folks. It's the confused, negative nonsense. That's CNN. I'm tired of it, folks. I'm a history professor in Muscatine. And you know what? I have no problem with somebody expressing their opinion. But don't you dare even think that you're passing by on professional journalistic ethics and using the democratic talking points for every single one of your stories. Donald Trump is sending the world a message. He sent it in Syria. He sent it to China and India when we said, we're not going to cost jobs if the number one polluters are going to ignore the situation. He's, he is standing up for border security, an entirely, entirely new attitude about the whole thing. Veterans expanding health care, fairness in NATO, Supreme Court. And I'm hearing the media say he's yet to score big. Folks, he's done more in this last three months than Obama did his whole term. So finally, just let me stop with this. I put my notes away now. Other than that, by the way, I don't have a lot of opinions this evening. <laughs> but I had the opportunity about three weeks ago, in all seriousness, I'm a seventh generation Iowa farm boy. I've got three sons. I think a lot about our future. When you're a history professor, you sometimes do. And I had a chance to talk to Donald Trump for 45 minutes. Let me tell you how that 45 minutes went. We sat and we talked and he asked questions. He listened, he answered follow-up questions. He talked to us. He knew details about the states that were there in the Oval Office with him. Folks, I have been around the block many, many times in politics, but I'm gonna take off my Republican Party uh, chair hat and I'm gonna put on the hat of a proud Iowan and a proud father and let me tell you something, Thank God this man has taken his place in the Oval Office for my grandchildren and yours. So one final word, and I need you guys to help me out here because I have the media constantly saying, oh, I don't know if I was wavering. I'm going to leave you with this and walk off the stage and press. This is for you. Try reporting it sometime. How many of you stand with Donald J. Trump tonight? Okay, y'all sit down, relax, we can all take a breath. He's 100% right. Thank you for standing up. That's a really good visual, but he's right. We'll never see it. But we'll, we, what we will see now is I gotta share with you, our next guest is a huge treat. She's not only a dear friend of mine, she's not only Eric Trump's beautiful wife, she's Donald Trump's daughter-in-law, she's a senior advisor on the campaign, and she's not only beautiful on the inside as well as the outside, she's a soon-to-be mother. Would you put your hands together for Laura Trump?
I have to tell you, I am so excited to get out of New York and be right here in Iowa among all my fellow deplorables. As you heard, my name is Laura Trump, and I am so proud to say that I am the daughter-in-law of our president, Donald J. Trump. You know, I had the incredible opportunity throughout the campaign to travel around this great country. I was here in your state very often with Tana. And I have to tell you, everywhere I went, I said the same thing. I said I could not wait until January 20th, 2017, when I could officially call my father-in-law the President of the United States. And let me tell you something else. Ladies and gentlemen, we are over five months in and it is not getting old yet, is it? You know, this, this hasn't been easy. It hasn't been easy for our family. It certainly has not been easy for the president. It would have been much easier for Donald Trump to do what so many other people have done and say, you know what, this country is going in the wrong direction. I know it, we all see it, but I'll be okay, my family will be okay, most everyone I know will probably be fine. But you see, that's not the kind of guy that Donald Trump is. Because Donald Trump loves this country. Donald Trump loves the people of this country. He loves the military. He loves our law enforcement. And he saw what was happening in this country. He saw a country that had given him everything crumbling before his very eyes. Let's not forget, this country has made Donald Trump the epitome of the American dream. And he saw that being stripped away from all of us. And he said, you know what? I know that I'm the only person who can bring the American dream back. And that is why he is in the Oval Office working harder than I've ever seen him work. And we saw him work pretty hard on that campaign trail, didn't we? I have never seen him work as hard as he is right now because although the left is trying to stop him, although the media is trying to stop him, it doesn't matter to Donald Trump because he has one concern and one concern only, you, the American people. I think we can all agree this was not a normal election. It was not just a campaign. Ladies and gentlemen, this was a movement in our country. This was the American people saying enough is enough. We are sick and tired of what we see happening in Washington, D.C. We are sick and tired of having no representation there, and we're taking our country back. That's what happened on November 8th. By the way, did anybody see what happened in Georgia last night? We are 4 and 0, ladies and gentlemen. And you look at the other side, I got to say. It looks like they're struggling a little bit, aren't they? You know what? Our president is doing an incredible job across the board. I am so proud of him. But I have to say thank you to all of you. Because as you heard, I am pregnant with my first child due in September. <laughs> this will be the president's ninth grandchild, but I am so happy that I can bring my son into a world where Donald Trump is our president. So thank you for voting him into office because all of you made it happen. And we're going to do it again in 2020, aren't we? And we feel the love and support. I have so many people come up to me to tell me they're still supporting the president, that they haven't lost faith, that they know that he's doing an incredible job. Keep up the faith, folks. He is killing it in Washington, D.C. And the only reason you hear bad stuff is because they are very scared of what they know he's going to do. They have seven and a half more years, so I suggest they buckle up, right? Thank you.
thank you on behalf of my entire family. Thank you for supporting our family. Thank you for supporting our president. Thank you for supporting our country. It is so incredible to be among you today and back here in Iowa. I had some of the greatest times here during the campaign. And I'll leave you with one thought. I knew we were going to win this election. So, didn't you? So many people asked me. So many times I was interviewed, so many people asked me, they said, do you really think that Donald Trump could win? I said, absolutely, I know he's going to win. And I'll tell you how I knew. Because everywhere I went, I had people coming up to me saying, we're praying for you. We are praying for your family. We are praying for Donald Trump. God was in this election, folks. Don't forget it. It has been so nice to be with you tonight, Iowa. Thank you so much. The next act is the big act, so thank you for having me tonight. God bless you.
Thank you, everybody. It is great to be back in the incredible, beautiful, great state of Iowa. Home of the greatest wrestlers in the world, including our friend Dan Gable. Some of the great, great wrestlers of the world, right? We love those wrestlers. It's always terrific to be able to leave that Washington swamp and spend time with the truly hardworking people. We call them American patriots, amazing people. I want to also extend our congratulations this evening to Karen Handel of Georgia. And we can't forget Ralph Norman in South Carolina. He called me and I called him. He said, you know, last night I felt like the forgotten man, but he won and he won really beautifully, even though most people, a lot of people didn't show up because they thought he was gonna win by so much. It's always dangerous to have those big leads. But he won very easily, and he is a terrific guy. And I'll tell you what, Karen is going to be really incredible. She's going to be joining some wonderful people and doing some wonderful work, including major, major tax cuts and health care and lots of things. <laughs> gonna be reducing crime and we're securing that Second Amendment. I told you about that. And that looks like it's in good shape with Judge Gorsuch. That looks like it's in good shape. I'd like to also take this moment to send our thoughts and prayers to our courageous friend, somebody that I've gotten to know very well, Steve Scalise, and everyone recovering from the assault. Never fails. <laughs> Never fails. Thank you. Thank you. And we love our police. We love our police. So to Steve we say, and he's a great guy, he was in my office the day before, incredible. We're praying for you. We're pulling for you. You have our absolute support and our deepest admiration. And our gratitude goes out tonight as well to the Capitol Police officers who saved so many lives. You know, they ran from the outfield in. They were being hit by rifle fire. They only had handguns, and they were able to get them. It was an amazing show of talent and bravery. So we want to thank all of the police officers who so bravely serve and protect us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hopefully our nation emerges from this ordeal. It was an ordeal. Terrible. More unified and more determined than ever before. And I can see it. And we are indeed more unified in our own way than ever before. You just have to take a look at what's happening here. Right? If we set aside the cynics and the critics, 
We have a chance, and it's a great chance. It lies before us to do extraordinary things for our country in the years ahead. History is written by the dreamers, not the doubters. So, while we are here tonight to celebrate the amazing progress that we've already made, and we have made amazing progress, we're also here to lay out the next steps in our incredible movement to make America great again. Everyone gathered in this arena is bound together by common values. You love our country. You obey our laws. You honor our traditions and you care for your families, and you love your communities. All you want is a government that shows you the same respect and loyalty in return. You believe that America must protect and defend its own citizens. With that conviction deep in your hearts, you showed up on Election Day, November 8th, and voted to put America first. It's about time. It's about time. And from the moment I took that solemn oath of office, and every single day since, that is exactly what I've done. Put America first. After years of sending our jobs and our wealth to other countries, we are finally standing up for our country. And you see it happening. You see it happening. You see what's going on. Jobs are just about the best they've ever been. We've created almost $4 trillion in wealth. If you look at your stock values and you look at what's going on with our country, but we've created tremendous wealth. The enthusiasm and spirit on every single index is higher than it's ever been before for our manufacturers and for our company. After spending billions of dollars defending other people's borders, we are finally going to defend our borders. decades of rebuilding foreign nations all over the world. We are now rebuilding our nation. As of a few months ago, our country has spent six trillion dollars in the Middle East. Wasted. And the lives, the lives. Thousands and thousands and thousands of lives. Six trillion dollars and thousands of young, beautiful lives. We started 16 years ago, and it's in far worse shape than it was 16 years ago, by many times over. So we spent all of this money, all of these lives, and let me tell you, I came in and took over a very, very difficult hand. But we're going to get it fixed. That's what you put me here for. We're going to get it fixed.
We'll get it fixed. It's a shame. It's a shame. And then you look at North Korea. Thank you. Then you look at your we're praying, and I'm praying for you. That's true. <laughs> Thank you very much. But you look at North Korea, what's going? Look at Otto, beautiful Otto. Went over there a healthy, wonderful boy. And you see how he came back. You see how he came back. So we've been given a bad hand, but we're going to take that bad hand and it'll all be good. In addition to that, we're going to start taking care of our country. The people are the rulers of this country once again, one by one. We are keeping the promises we made to the people of Iowa and the people all over our country. We are not going to let the same failed and tired voices in Washington keep us from delivering the change you voted for and the change that you deserve, that you deserve. I do not answer to any donors or financial contributors. I don't care about them. I am not beholden to any consultants or any of the very powerful special interests. I don't care about them. I have to do what's right. And if they're right, that's good. And we will never be intimidated by the dishonest media corporations who will say anything and do anything to get people to watch their screens or to get people to buy their failing papers. They are failing. These entrenched forces are fighting only for themselves and in many cases for their survival. But I'm fighting for you. I'm fighting for you. <laughs> fighting for your hopes, because your hopes are my hopes. I've had a great time in this country. I've had a great run. And it was time to do something. We all saw what was happening. It was time to do something. Your dreams are my dreams. And your future is what I'm focused on each and every day. We're going to make America great again. Believe me, we're going to make America great again. Here are just some of the historic accomplishments we've achieved in just a very short period of time. And I have to just preface it by saying, thank you, darling. <laughs> I have to preface it by saying, you know, I've been watching and they're saying, President Trump has not produced health care. You know, I've been there for five months. <laughs> if you remember, during the Clinton period, they worked for years and years and years. They never got health care. Obama. <laughs> Although in after listening to that testimony, I fully understand. <laughs> but President Obama, his whole administration, pushing, pushing for Obamacare, which has now failed. In fact, I was just told by your great governor and ex-governor that your insurance companies have all fled the state of Iowa. Pretty sad, isn't it? Well, they're flooding. I tell you what, they're going from every state. They're leaving all of the states. Obamacare is a disaster. It's over. And there's nothing to compare what we're doing. I think, I hope, I hope the Republican Senate, if we went and got the single greatest health care plan in the history of the world, we would not get one Democrat vote because they're obstructionists. They're obstructionists. We wouldn't get one Democrat. If we came to you and said, here's your plan, you're going to have the greatest plan in history. 
and you're going to pay and nothing. Did vote against it, folks. <laughs> Every single vote. So we have a very slim 52 to 48. That means we basically can't lose anybody. And I think and I hope, can't guarantee anything, but I hope we're going to surprise you with a really good plan. You know, I've been talking about a plan with heart. I said, add some money to it. A plan with heart. But Obamacare is dead. But it is interesting how they say Donald Trump is not producing health care, not producing. So we've produced so much legislation. I don't think any president, it could be somebody, I have to be a little careful because they'll say, he lied. <laughs> so few presidents, few, just have to be a little careful. Because they'll say, headline, Donald Trump lies to the people of Iowa. I don't want to. <laughs> but very few have done what we've done when you look at the regulations, when you look at all of, you know, they were saying, but he didn't pass legislative bills. I think it's 38, and we're going to be talking about them. 38. And they, they, if you listen to them, 38. But, but, but. And some of them are really big, having to do with regulation, having to do with lots of different things. But we're working really hard on massive tax cuts. It would be, if we get it the way I want it, the largest tax cut in the history of the United States of America. Because right now, we are one of the highest taxed nations in the world, really on a large-scale basis, we are the highest tax nation in the world. And we're going to get it down really low, okay? Real, I don't say the lowest, because there are a couple that are really down there. But that doesn't mean you want to be there. But we're going to have one of the lowest taxes from the highest tax, and we're working hard on it. And I think it's going to happen. And I'll tell you, I think healthcare is going to happen and infrastructure is going to happen. You're going to have a lot of exciting things over the next few months. And I look forward to being able to produce it. Let's see what happens. And, and by the way, if we had even a little Democrat support, just a little, like a couple of votes, you'd have everything. And you could give us a lot of votes, and we'd even be willing to change it and move it around and try and make it even better. It's going to have good heart, but even better. But again, they just want to stop. They just want to obstruct. A few votes, seriously, a few votes from the Democrats, it could be so easy and so beautiful and you'd have cooperation. And their plan isn't working because they thought they were going to win last night in Atlanta. They thought they were going to win. And they've been unbelievably nasty, really nasty. And they thought they spent close to $30 million on this kid who forgot to live in the community that he was in. I mean, you know. Look, I'll tell you about the Democrats. I am making it a little bit hard to get their support, but who cares? I'll, but I'll tell you about the Democrats. They raised a fortune for them. They fought like hell. They said they were going to win. All of the television networks, other than Fox, which really has treated us fairly, by the way. They have. But they built these studios. CNN. <laughs> Whoop. Hey, the camera just went off. I can't imagine. It's covered live. The camera just went off. I can't imagine why. This phony, this phony NBC television network. They actually had one of the people say, you know, it was a little rainy last night. Maybe that was the difference in Karen's race. Can you believe that? But, but they had these beautiful studios. And if Karen Handel had lost, they, were, they would have blamed it on me, which is fine. But if she had lost, they would have been there for weeks talking about this. This would have been the greatest defeat in the history of American politics. 
When she won, when they said, projected winner is Karen Handel. <laughs> then they said, we switch to another program, right? So <laughs> it was so short. They couldn't get out of there fast enough. <laughs> and don't forget, this happened in Montana, right? In Kansas. Last night, South Carolina with Ralph, who was expected to win any one. California, so, but it, it's been, it's been incredible. So we're five and oh, we're five and oh. And, and they thought they were going to win at least like three, right? Wouldn't you say at least three? And it would be a devastating defeat. The truth is people love us, all of us. They love us. They don't get it. They haven't figured it out yet. You know, they're still trying to figure where all of those voters came from. Those voters came out of the hills. They came. These are hardworking. We have the hardest working, the smartest people, the toughest people. They're very lucky that our people don't protest. Believe me. <laughs> Believe me. They're very lucky. Well, I, we have them. We have the smart ones. We have the toughest ones. Great, great Americans. And Hillary said the deplorables. These are just the opposite, believe me, of the deplorables. These are just the opposite. We have a group, Bikers for Trump. You ever see them? They come by the thousands. Oh, oh, my man. Look, how are you? We have the bike. I didn't know you were here. They're here. Now we know we're protected. That's great. Good to have you, man. These are great people. And when I see them, I say, now we're safe. And they like Trump, and it don't make sense. Farmers are able to plow their fields. If they have a puddle in the middle of their field, a little puddle the size of this, it's considered a lake, and you can't touch it. And if you touch it, bad, bad things happen to you and your family. We got rid of that one, too, okay? Unemployment is at a 16-year low, and manufacturing is doing phenomenally, and we have companies moving back. They're coming back, back, back. You know, in the state of Michigan, which has just been like an exit pool where car companies have left, I told them, you know what? You want to start leaving? You want to fire all these people? You watch what we're going to be doing. You watch what we're going to be doing. Not going to be too long. We have the legendary Wall Street genius Wilbur Ross here. He's our Secretary of Commerce. We have Gary Cohn, who is the president of Goldman Sachs. In fact, somebody, he's the president of Goldman Sachs. He had to pay over $200 million in taxes to take the job, right? So somebody said, why did you appoint a rich person? to be in charge of the economy. I said, no, it's true. And Wilbur's a very rich person in charge of commerce. I said, because that's the kind of thinking we want. I wanted that. But these are people that are great, brilliant business minds, and that's what we need, that's what we have to have, so the world doesn't take advantages of it. We can't have the world taking advantage of us anymore. And I love all people, rich or poor, but in those particular positions, I just don't want a poor person. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? If you insist, I'll do it, but I like it better this way, right? So we've achieved a historic increase in defense spending, and we've created a new office of accountability 
at the VA, our veterans, to ensure that our veterans get the care that they so richly deserve, our veterans. We've eliminated restrictions on the production of American energy. They wanted to take away our wealth. The world wanted to take away our wealth. We happen to be lucky. Under our feet, we have great wealth. Not only in the form of your kind of wealth, which is beautiful, fertile soil, but also in other locations in the form of energy. They wanted to take that power and that wealth away from us. And we've ended the war on clean, beautiful coal. And we're putting our miners back to work. In fact, you read about it. Last week, a brand new coal mine just opened in the state of Pennsylvania. First time in decades. Decades. We've reversed it. And 33,000 mining jobs have been added since my inauguration. And again, we're going to have all forms of energy. But coal is something we have a tremendous advantage of. But we're going to have all, whether it's natural gas, whether it's alternative sources, we're going to have everything. But a power is coal. It's a power for our electric different plants and for our furnaces. It's a power. We use electric, we use wind, we use solar, we use coal, we use natural gas. We will use nuclear if the right opportunity presents itself. We're going to be strong for the future. We're going to be strong for the future. I don't want to just hope the wind blows to light up your homes and your factories. as the birds fall to the ground. <laughs> but I like all of them, and that's what we need. And by the way, we're saving your ethanol industries in the state of Iowa, just like I promised I would do in my campaign. And believe me, they are under siege, folks. I don't know if you know it, but they are under siege. We've approved, first day, the Keystone XL Pipeline and the Dakota Access Pipeline. First day, day one. Thirty-eight thousand jobs, and better for the environment. By the way, better underground, better for the environment, and safer. Can you imagine the executive? For Keystone, who a year and a half ago was told it's dead, and they have billions invested, they bought half of the pipe. And somebody walks into his office, probably a consultant that charged him tens of millions of dollars. Sir, the pipeline was just approved. Now, you know what he's going to do. He said, I did a great job, sir. I'm entitled to millions of dollars in consulting fees. It was just Trump approving the pipeline. We approved it. We approved it. It's good for the country. <laughs> My man. And by the way, speaking of that, when I'm signing for the XL pipeline and the Dakota, I said, by the way, who made the pipe? You don't want to know. USA. No, not the USA, believe me. <laughs> I said, who made the pipe? Now, in all fairness to them, they bought a lot of their pipe already, so it's a little hard to say, throw that away, we're giving you, you know. But I put a little clause, handwritten. It said, anybody builds a pipeline in the United States will use American steel and fabricate in America. No more taking it over on boats. Very simple. We've signed 39 pieces of legislation. That means going through Congress, folks. Because, you know, they tell you, these guys, the fake news. They tell you, it's fake news, fake. Not all of it. Some of it's good. And some of the people are great, actually. But some are real bad and they're really fake. But 
If you listen to them, we didn't pass any, we passed 39, I'm not talking about executive orders, which we've signed a lot. I mean, we have really signed a lot. And we've gotten rid of a lot of really bad pieces that were signed by President Obama, believe me. But if you listen to the fake news, they say like, he didn't pass any legislation. Everything's executive, it's wrong. 39 pieces as of today. Some of them very important. Now, my biggest pieces are yet to come. Hopefully, taxes. Hopefully, health care. Hopefully, infrastructure. And when they come, that won't be good enough either. See so you watch. But we've also done a record number of resolutions to eliminate the job killing regulations on our workers, our companies, and our farmers. They're gone. They're gone. We are ending the federal intrusion into your family farms and your ranches. And we're also working very, very hard to get rid of the death tax so that you can pass your farms onto your children and onto your grandchildren. I don't know if we're going to pull that one off, but we're working very hard to do it. Right, Chris? This way you can pass your motorcycle on, okay? Forget about the farm, right? That's not so bad either. I've seen what you, what you ride. Not so bad. But we're working on, I don't know if that one's going to get pulled off, but it should. Because you should have a right. Why should you be double taxed? You should have a right to pass your farm onto your children and onto your grandchildren. You should have that right. Without having them, Without having them going out and borrowing a fortune, not being able to make payments, losing it to the banks, it's not fair. So we're working hard. Let's see if we pull it off. We're going to try very hard, I can tell you. I don't know, but we're going to try. No longer will the EPA be telling you how to run your business or do your job or live your life. Instead, it will focus on its true mission, clean air, and clean, beautiful, crystal water, nice, beautiful, clean water. That's what we want, right? Right? We're also ending the last administration's federal land grab. We believe states, communities, and private landowners know best how to manage their own resources. We've made a lot of progress in that. Ryan Zinke. We want to see local control. That also means we're not going to let foreign bureaucrats plan our economy or tell Americans how to run their country. You know what I mean? When I campaigned for president, I promised to renegotiate or to leave any deal which fails to serve. America's interests. And I'm not going to allow other countries to take advantage of the United States any longer. And for that reason, I totally cut off negotiations. I will not do a great, what is it? P, go ahead, P, do you know what it is? Ah, uh, P, 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 yes. You guys weren't listening to that, huh? <laughs> but for that reason, and that too, as you know, I formally announced that the United States will withdraw from the disastrous Paris Climate Accord. It's a disaster. It's a disaster. And by the way, Trans-Pacific Partnership, we don't even talk about it anymore because that was done early, but Trans-Pacific Partnership, bye-bye. That was, that was another NAFTA catastrophe that we're gonna, by the way, renegotiate. 
You know, I announced I'm going to get rid of NAFTA. And I've always told you I'll either renegotiate or terminate NAFTA. So I announced that essentially I was going to terminate, but I got a very, very nice call from Prime Minister Trudeau of Canada, from the President, a good guy of Mexico, asking me not to terminate it. Could we negotiate? And I'm always willing to negotiate. I'm always willing. So we'll see. We'll see how it works. But it's been very unfair to the United States. Now, you, all you have to do is look at all the empty buildings, all the empty plants and factories all over the country. NAFTA has been a disaster. So we're going to either renegotiate it successfully, which would be my first choice, or we're going to terminate it, and that's going to be that. Now, the Paris Agreement, and it's amazing how the people of this country get it because the press covers it so unfairly. The Paris Agreement would have cost America millions of lost jobs and billions and billions of lost dollars and put us at a permanent economic disadvantage. China doesn't kick in until 2030. I could tell you stories, I could give you stats, I could go on all day. It's a catastrophe if we would have agreed. And they all say it's non-binding. Like hell, it's non-binding. When we get sued by everybody because we thought it was non-binding, then you can tell me it was non-binding. I was elected to serve the citizens of Iowa and Pennsylvania and Ohio and Michigan and Wisconsin and Florida and all 50 states and all 320 million American citizens. By the way, this is a big place. This place is... And, and, you know, I used to say it during the campaign. I'm sure it hasn't changed. But we're not even campaigning. And look at this crowd. So, you know, it's easier during a campaign. The place is packed with thousands of people trying to get in. Look at the size of this place. They'll never show the crowd. They'll never show the crowd. They'll never show the crowd. That's the only good thing about the protesters, which we don't have very much of. I mean, this guy was blowing a whistle, you know. He's a Bernie Sanders guy. But, but we don't have any. But when we do have one, the only good thing is the cameras have to go, and they have to go sometimes up into the little so corners, way up in that arena. Every seat is packed. Look at that. Every seat. Every corner is packed of this big, big arena, so it's an honor. Wouldn't it be great if they showed? You know, it's funny. I'd go home and my wife would say, Melania, who, by the way, has become very popular. She's, they're liking her. They're liking her. But she'd say, I never saw the crowd. But it sounded like a lot of people. You know, you can tell. You can't imitate the sound of this many people. This is not like 500 people. A th this is big stuff. You can't imitate that. You know what they don't understand? They get these massive ratings. I hate to give it. They probably charge a fortune. I know they charge a fortune. But all those television cameras, all those live ones. And I hate to do this, but they'd get even better ratings if they'd show that. And I try and convince them. But that they can't do. They just can't mentally handle that one. So it's what <laughs> But it is, it's such a great crowd.
to all of those people watching, it's an unbelievable place. It is a big, beautiful arena, and it is packed. So as you may know, there is another absolutely terrible deal from the previous administration. See how nice I am? I say the previous administration as opposed to the Obama administration. <laughs> that I have recently rescinded. Last week I announced that we are canceling the prior administration's completely one-sided deal with the Castro regime in Cuba. Isn't it amazing? Obama can deal with Cuba. He kills thousands of people, people in prison, horrible to women, horrible to every. Can deal with Iran. You talk about bad, the gays, the women, the bad to everybody, kill, brutal. I deal with anybody. It's like Donald Trump is a terrible human being. It's unbelievable, isn't it? Isn't it unbelievable? It's unbelievable. But America will stand strong against communist oppression. We will make a much better deal. I mean, the fact is, the deal with Cuba is a bad deal. We'll probably make a deal, and maybe we won't. Maybe we won't. But you know what? If we make a deal, it's going to be a fair deal and a good deal for us. It's not going to be a one-sided giveaway. We're also fighting every single day to achieve those fair trade deals for Americans' factories and your farmers and your I just left an event where I honored him, introduced him to a crowd of people that adore him to discuss how to create, I mean, he's been doing this for years in Iowa, serving governor in American history, and now he carries the title of ambassador to China, Terry Branstad. It's a fantastic guy. You know, I told the story today. I said, I'd come here to make a speech. We'd have a big crowd in Iowa. And Terry would come and say, at that time, he didn't call me Mr. President, he called me Donald. I said, that's okay, I didn't think about it. Now if he called me Donald, I'd be very angry with him, right? <laughs> Get it. But he said, Donald, could you do me a favor? Don't say anything bad about China. We do a lot of business with China. I like China a lot. I've known President Xi for a long time. I really like him. And he also, by the way, likes Terry a lot. And just please don't say anything bad about China, which is hard for me to do. <laughs> and I wouldn't. But then when I won, and we're looking for somebody to represent us with China, which is a very, very powerful country, and we've had a very good relationship with China, in all fairness, and I do like President Xi. I wish we would have a little more help with respect to North Korea from China, but that doesn't seem to be working out. But I do like the president a lot. So when I was thinking of who am I going to make the ambassador to China after, you know, having a good retentive mind, I said, you know, I remember about a year ago when Terry Branstad was saying all of these great things, your governor. So I called him up. I said, listen, you've been doing this for 24 years. You want to do something else? Like, how would you like to be ambassador to China? And I didn't think he'd really do it. <laughs> it's a long trip. 21 hours, that's a, lot of, that's a lot of plane time. But he wants to do what's right for the country. And I said to him tonight, I said, I wasn't sure you were going to do it. He said, when my president calls me, to help him with our great country, I do it. That's what he said to me. I thought it was nice. Thought it was nice. Right. It's 
So central to that economic agenda is a plan to restore America's crumbling infrastructure. We will rebuild not only America, but we will rebuild rural America. In this great national rebuilding, we will follow two simple rules. We will buy American, and we will hire American. We want to get our people off of welfare and back to work. We also want to preserve our safety net for struggling Americans who truly need help. We want to help them. People that truly need help. Right, Chris? We want to help those people. But others don't treat us fairly. That's why I believe the time has come for new immigration rules, which say that those seeking admission into our country must be able to support themselves financially and should not use welfare for a period of at least five years. And we'll be putting in legislation to that effect very shortly. Another core principle is that those coming to our country must embrace our values and love our people. And yes, we will build the wall. We've already started planning. It will be built. We will build the wall. We need it. We need it. We have to stop the drugs from blowing in. You know, people don't realize we're already spending a lot of money on design. But I'll give you an idea that nobody has heard about yet. And I'm not sure, but I'm a builder. That's what I love to do. That's probably what I do best. I'm a builder. And we're thinking of something that's unique. We're talking about the southern border. Lots of sun, lots of heat. We're thinking about building the wall as a solar wall. So it creates energy and pays for itself. And this way, Mexico will have to pay much less money. And that's good, right? Is that good? You're the first group I've told that to. It's solar wall. Makes sense. Let's see. We're working it out. We'll see. Solar wall panels. Beautiful. I mean, actually, think of it. The higher it goes, the more valuable it is. It's like... Pretty good imagination, right? Good. My idea. So we have a good shot. That's one of the places that solar really does work. The tremendous sun and heat, it really does work there. So we'll see what happens with that. That would be great. And I think we could make it look beautiful, too. It would really look beautiful. So that would be nice. We're also working night and day to restore law and order to our country. Law and order. You know that. We're reversing the last administration's soft on crime policies that helped enable a tragic rise in violent crime. You see what's happening. Look at Chicago. What the hell is going on in Chicago? What's that all about? We have also issued new directives to protect our police officers and our sheriffs. And we'll always stand with the incredible men and women of law enforcement. 
All American children, no matter where they live, have the right to grow up in a safe community. No issue is more central to public safety than the issue of immigration and border security. After years of lawlessness, the United States is now enforcing our laws, first time in a long time, and protecting our workers, our schools, and our families. Since I was elected, illegal border crossings, and this is without the wall, before the wall, have decreased by more than 75 percent, a historic and unprecedented achievement. So we're building the wall on the southern border. We've got the greatest security people in the world. I'll tell you, ICE and the Border Patrol folks, these are incredible people. You know, they endorsed me when I ran for president, knowing that if I win, they're going to have to work much, much harder. But they love this country, and they want the job done, and they want the job done right. They have to work harder, and it's much more dangerous. The other thing that I have to tell you, you have a gang called MS-13. A friend of mine who's a very, very high-level police officer said to me in describing them, they are the equivalent or worse than Al-Qaeda. I would say that's a bad statement. They don't like to shoot people. They like to cut people. They do things that nobody can believe. These are true animals. We are moving them out of the country by the thousands, by the thousands. And the people moving them out are, guess what, a hell of a lot tougher and meaner than they are, but they're on our side. We're getting them out. MS-13. During my campaign for president, I met with the families of Americans killed by illegal immigrants, many, many families, including the parents of Sarah Root, a 21-year-old Iowa girl who was killed the day after she graduated from college with a 4.0 GPA. You know what that is? To those of you that don't know, that means solid A's straight across, number one student. Thousands of beautiful American lives like Sarah's have been stolen for the simple reason that our government has refused to enforce already existing laws. The media, these people, like to talk about separating families. But the families they never talk about are the American families separated forever from the ones they love because we don't protect our borders and uphold the immigration laws of the United States. These families and the victims have been ignored totally by the media. They were ignored by the consultants. They've been ignored by Washington. But these Americans were not ignored by me or by you, and we know who they are. And they rise now to the highest level. They rise to the highest level. I promise those families the deaths of their loved ones will not have been in vain and that we will take strong and forceful action to fulfill our sacred duty to save and protect American lives. Every single day, we are finding these gang members, these drug dealers, thieves, robbers, predators, criminals, killers, horrible killers. And we are throwing them the hell out of our country.
And when they're gone, our now very strong borders, especially with the wall, will never allow them back in. So we're doing a lot of things. We're very proud of what we've done. Justice Gorsuch was a big, big deal. Big deal. Somebody explained it to me beautifully. They said, when you pick a Supreme Court judge, you want great intellect, you want all of the things, but you also want youth, because they'll be there for 40 years. So if Judge Gorsuch, who I've gotten to know, who I think is a fantastic human being, aside from being a brilliant, brilliant student and person, and one of the great legal writers that exists in our country, probably in the world today, every time you see a decision written over the next 30 or 40 years, and especially if it's a five to four decision, like perhaps on Second Amendment or so many other things, you have done something that you can't value. It's so important. Think of it, for a 30 to 40 year period, potentially, you've influenced this country. And I've always heard long that just about the most important thing you can do, I always say defense, but perhaps outside, because we are going to have a strong military and strong defense, and we need it now. But I've always heard that the most important thing a president can do is pick a great Supreme Court justice. So I've got one, probably have some more, but it is really important. And think of that, over years and years, those decisions that are so important, values, great values. So I'm very, very proud of that pick. He's already been there now for almost two months, and people are saying, wow, that is a tremendous person and a tremendous intellect. So we're all very proud of that pick. And you made it possible. So I began this campaign on June 16th. A couple of days ago, two years. This is my birthday on June 14th, flag day of all things. And we came down the escalator, that famous escalator ride, Melania, myself. And the place went nuts. And hopefully because they like me, but I think also they like the policies. I said the truth. I talked about immigration. I talked about what was happening on the borders. I talked about our military. I talked about the drug problems, which are tremendous, even in Iowa, tremendous problems beyond anything we've ever seen before. I talked about all of it. And you know what? We were never off center stage in the debates. We stayed, you know what that means. We were number one all the way through. All the way through. We were number one all the way through because of people like you. Never off center. 17 people running. I kept looking up and down. I said, boy, that's a lot of people. Some of them very talented. But 17 people running. We were never off center stage in those debates. And that's because of people like yourselves, because you agree with me. And we are making such incredible progress. We are making progress like nobody can believe. These people are being driven crazy. <laughs> crazy. I mean, they have phony witch hunts going against me. They have everything going. And you know what? All we do is win, win, win. We won last night. They can't believe it. They're saying, what is going on? What is going on? We won last night. And even the worst of them said, that was a big win for Trump. I couldn't believe it, actually. Thank you very much, folks. I appreciate it. 
But we have made a journey together like no other ever in the history of this country, and maybe beyond that. But you look in the history of this country, there's never been anything like this that's happened. We're straightening out through common sense and through a good heart, we're straightening out our country. We're straightening out our country. No matter our beliefs, no matter our party, it's time for us to remember that we are all Americans and that we are in this together. And it would be great if the Republicans and the Democrats could come together and get really, really great legislation passed. Some of the geniuses were saying this morning, you know, from the time he announced on June 16th, two years ago, they've been hitting the hell out of him. Hillary took almost all negative ads. The problem was when people went to vote, they didn't know what she stood for other than she was saying bad things about me. And I almost became like, Yes. Think of it. So from the time I announced, I've been hit, hit, hit. Then from the time I got in, I said, oh, this is going to be great. Finally, we're going to all come together. They hit me harder, harder, harder. They've now learned, I think, that that doesn't work. Five and oh, five and oh. It doesn't work. They need to be positive. They can't continue to be obstructionists. That's all they have going. So they should come together. I don't think they will. But I will tell you, it would be a beautiful, beautiful thing if we could get together as two parties that love our country and come up with that great health care and come up with that great tax deal for our people and tax reform and infrastructure and so many other things. Just think about what a unified American nation could achieve. Nobody could even come close to us. And by the way, even if we're not totally unified, nobody's coming close to us either. Don't worry about it. Gleaming new roads and bridges that would inspire awe and wonder all over the world. You know, we used to be the leader in airports. We'd have the most beautiful airports. Now we're like a third world country. LaGuardia. Newark, LAX, Kennedy, they're like third world airports. Take a look, take a look. We used to be the leader. Now you go to Saudi Arabia, where I just came back. A monumental, epic trip. Because I said, you cannot continue to fund terrorism. You cannot continue to fund terrorism. And the king of Saudi Arabia, who is really become just, he's a very special man. I mean that. He is taking it to heart. And now they're fighting with other countries that have been funding terrorism. And I think we had a huge impact. We will see. But I think we had a tremendous impact. We cannot let these incredibly rich nations fund radical Islamic terror or terrorism of any kind. We cannot let it happen. <laughs> cannot let it happen. It was one of the great two days of my life, and I'm sure a lot of you watched it on television. 54 Muslim nations coming together, some immensely powerful wealthy nations, and everybody in that room was unified, and the ones that weren't, they're trying to get them to be unified and to do the right thing. I think it could have a tremendous impact. But not only that, I said, for me to go, 
I'm only going, we had to negotiate, if you spend billions of dollars, billions, on having things manufactured in our country with our jobs and our workers for your country. And hundreds of billions of dollars were spent and given to American companies who are going to make American products and send those products over to the wealthy countries of the Middle East. I mean hundreds of billions of dollars. And people haven't talked about that, but to me that was very important because we want those jobs. We want those jobs. So they're making airplanes, they're making all sorts of things, hundreds of billions of dollars, and it's going back, and I'm very proud of that. That's something people don't talk about because the real purpose of my being there was to make sure these countries do not fund terror any longer. So, I just want to leave Iowa. I said that I'd come back. Oh, I love that you're not, look, look at that. You don't want me to leave. I don't want to leave either. I don't, I don't want to leave either. I don't want to leave either. But I said I would come back. And I made lots of statements to your governor and to your current governor. Kim is going to be a fantastic governor. She's here. She's going to be a fantastic governor. But I said that I was going to come back. I said that I was going to protect your ethanol for good reason, only for good reason. And it was very important to me. I said that I was going to do things for the people of Iowa. And I want to let you know, I've done it for the people of Iowa, but I've really done it for the people of our country. Our country is getting stronger. It's getting better. We're going to be setting records in so many different ways. We're going to straighten out all of the mess that's happened over the last long period of time where we went into other nations to tell them how to run their country. And we had no idea. But I just want to thank all of the people that are here tonight. I want to thank the people of Iowa. You are incredible people. I want to thank you for your incredible support. And I just want to let you know that God blesses you. And I want to just say, you are special in every way. God bless you, and God bless America. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much.